Everybody's doing good? So, just randomly yell, how are you doing today? Good. Oh, sorry, I hope you feel better. Uh, anyway, today we're going to talk about are you working too hard, and for some of you, that feels like your life. Um, you feel like the plate spinner, you ever seen the plate spinner, Merv Griffin? I know, you don't know who Merv Griffin is. You know, um, years ago, uh, my dad owned a construction company and uh, for years and years, and uh, my brother-in-law told us his story recently, and when my dad would leave the job site to go get something, he would come back, and almost inevitably, he thought that nobody was working while he was gone. Sometimes that was probably true, but um, so he came back this one time, and he didn't think that the guys were working hard enough or fast enough, and at that point, they were taking two-by-fours, and they were using a tool that used a bullet and it drives nails into concrete using a, a, I believe it's a 22 bullet. And apparently you popped it together and then you hit it and it fired the bullet into the wall. So my dad was basically took the tool from them and started putting the things up himself to show them how quickly you could do it. But one of the times, he, because he was in a hurry, he didn't quite pop it together. And when he hit it, the bullet went through the wall of the building and it was a remodel. It went into the kitchen, went through a kitchen cabinet, bounced around, and ended up spinning on the countertop in the kitchen. My dad had to replace part of the kitchen and the wall and had to get a, people to come in because he was in a hurry. But listen, listen to what happens next. This is where the story gets good. So instead of recognizing that he probably shouldn't have been in a hurry or that, you know, he was trying to do it too fast, he took the tool out to the truck, took a sledgehammer out, and destroyed the tool because it had to be the tool's fault that it didn't work. Now, as much as you look at that story, you think, well, he should have known. <clears throat> Some of you today are really frustrated, and you're irritated, and you're grumpy, and you're stressed out and you're freaked out, and you are blaming something, or even worse, someone for your stress. So let's just get this out of the way. It's your fault. <laughs> now I want to read this verse, and for most of you this makes no sense. Most of you don't practice this verse. You, when you read this verse, you think, what is he talking about? Because the truth is, you don't have it. Most Christians do not live this verse. Jesus said this, come to me, all you who are weary. Anybody in here ever feel weary? And burdened. And I will give you more to do. Most of us, most of us feel like the Christian life is just one more thing to do. Most of us feel like having a quiet time is something on our to-do list. We feel like going to church is one more thing on our to-do list. Reading the Bible is one more thing. You're just giving me one more thing to do. And our Christian life and our attitude reflects that. But listen to this. Then he says this. Take my yoke. And it's not talking about eggs. Yoke's on you. Hey, these are the jokes, folks. This is why you should be in the talent show and not me. <laughs> Take my yoke upon you. A yoke is something that a horse or a mule used to pull a plow or something else, okay? And you can put two in one, all that kind of stuff, okay? Jesus says, Take my yoke, and I'll explain all this in a minute, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find, what's the next word? Say it out loud. Rest. Rest for your soul. Listen to this. Jesus then says this. For my yoke is easy. What? And my burden is light. Now leave this up here for just a second. This word easy is the word for refreshing. The word for refreshing. And I'll be honest with you. I worked at a restaurant on Sundays. Most Christians that came in on Sundays did not look refreshed. They were some of the worst people to wait on. They were grumpy, self-centered, selfish, demanding. I don't know about you, but I don't see any of that in there. Now, now here's what this means in the context. At the time of Jesus, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the other religious leaders, 
And even today, if you talk to a rabbi, they talk about the yoke of the law. And they say, don't take on the yoke of the world. Don't take on the yoke of worry. Take on the yoke of the law. And what happened during the time of Jesus was, Jesus even said, you're putting burdens on people that God didn't put on people. And, and they, were, they came up with more and more and more. They had a rule for everything. They had a rule for everything. And of course, typically the rules didn't apply to them. It's like government work, right? And so my yoke is easy. What Jesus was saying to them is, it's not a yoke of the law. It's not trying to do stuff. The yoke of Christ we're going to talk about today should take the pressure off of you. But the truth is, too many of us, the Christian life is drudgery. We can t tend to be the most exhausted, irritated, and frustrated people on earth. When you talk to people about Christians, they're judgmental, they're frustrated. And yet, the Bible says that our life should be, you ready for this? Refreshing. Full of peace and joy. This word, my yoke is easy, is the word refreshing. Now, young people, I want to tell you about a very important thing. It's called the nest tea plunge. It's important that you understand this illustration. Because all of us have experienced the nest tea plunge. They had a commercial on TV and the person would be sweating and looking like they were going to die of heat. And somebody would hand them a nest tea or a glass of nest tea. And they would pop open. You'd hear that. And they'd pop that nest tea open. And they'd begin to drink that nest tea. And all of a sudden, their eyes would close. And they would imagine themselves, arms out, doing what? Falling, Falling into a pool of water. By the way, if you try that, it's really not very comfortable. It's a little bit... And that's what it feels like when you're falling. But, you know, it looks really good on TV. But so they would, oh, and then the nasty punch. And then what would they say as soon as they open their eyes again? They would say, yeah. <sighs> Can I tell you something? Your Christian life should be, <sighs> but we've made Christianity be something it's not. Because we've gone back to the same thing it talks about in the book of Hebrews. We've gone back to the law. We've gone back to the to-do list. We've gone back to the here's what it looks like. Instead of understanding what God wants us to do. Now, here's some reasons, and we're going to talk about this. This is our whole thing today. Here's some reasons why we often work too hard. Number one, we're trying to please everyone. If you try to please everyone, you won't. John Maxwell used to say, the only person in charge of pleasing everyone is a clown. And let me tell you what I've learned about clowns. They don't please everyone. Number two, we're trying to silence the past. Something that happened to us in the past, something that maybe even happened to us on the way to church, something that happened to us maybe years ago, we try to silence it so we stay busy or we're fighting a voice that's not there anymore. Number three, we're trying to please ourselves. Number four, we're trying to please God through works. We think if I do one more thing, if I light one more candle, if I count one more bead, if I say one more Hail Eric Brookins, you know, then that... <laughs> is that not in your... So how can I work less and live in God's rest? We're going to talk about each of those things. So we're going to start out with the pleasing everyone. Number one, give others what they need, not what they want. I mean, the Rolling Stones even knew this one, right? Because you can't always get what you want. You just can't. But if you try sometimes, you might find that, that you get what you need. But, but you can't always get what you want. So listen to what it says in the Bible about this, okay? It, by the way, this should say Galatians. I messed up and printed the wrong uh, verse. But am I now trying to win the approval of human beings? If you spend your life trying to make everyone happy, you will be exhausted. You cannot say yes to everyone. Repeat after me. I cannot say yes to everyone. I cannot say yes to everyone. See, you did what I told you to. It's really not good. Don't do that. <laughs> oh, broke it. All right. Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Here's a Christian myth. A Christian myth is that you have to say yes to everyone to make them happy. You can say no. So I want you to practice. Just look at the person next to you and say no. Just for fun. Go. No. <laughs> if 
by the way, thanks for doing what I asked you to do. That was good, okay? Here's the truth. You have to say no sometimes. Now, in the fall, we're going to be doing a series called Boundaries. We're going to look at what the Bible says about appropriate boundaries for your life. Listen, I cannot even tell you this. We've been doing this with my group, and so we're going to bring it to the whole church. It's life-changing to begin to understand that how you say yes and how you say no is so important to life. But here's the deal. You've got to realize if you're a Christian, and I'm not assuming you're here and you're a Christian today, but if you're a Christian, you don't work for people. Listen to what it says in Colossians 3, 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. For some of you, that means you might want to work a little harder. <laughs> but for some of you, you might realize you're trying to please that boss all the time instead of saying, you know what, that's not who I'm trying to please. It might not change what you do at all, but it can change your attitude. In 2 Corinthians 9, it talks about what happens when we give with wrong motives. Now, this is talking about finances. By the way, I have no idea what anybody in our church gives. But, but this is talking about finances, but it applies to all of life. Listen to this. Let each man do according to what he's purposed in his heart. That means when you do something, it has to have a purpose. You can't just say yes to everybody. Listen to what they said and then consider, is this what God wants me to do? Is this something I'm supposed to do? That means sometimes some things you would have said no to, now you'll say yes. And it means some things you would have said yes to, you now say no, because you want to say yes to the best. Has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Stay right there for just a second. Can you imagine if when Dawson came forward this morning and I was handing him his gift, I said, you know, I really don't want to give this to you. <laughs> but I guess I have to because your mom, you know, I work for her. And, uh, right? Right? I mean, wouldn't he kind of be like, okay, um, no, no, really, you can keep it. The Lord wants you to give of your life because you want to. Because you realize what you've received. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But too often, because we think it's a checklist, we feel like, well, I guess I have to do this. I guess I have to. Listen, nobody wants you to give them anything that way. It's like when you say to your kids, clean up your room, and they go, <laughs> you don't go, oh, your attitude is so great, right? Now, my kids mess with me all the time because I say this in church all the time. You know, you don't expect your children to wake up in the morning and go, oh, father, my father, I have cleaned my room and dusted my bed. I've gone through the house and vacuumed everything. Is there anything thou wishes for me to do, father? Oh, father, right? But we wish that would happen, you know. And so, and so the truth is that how we give and what we do is so important. Resentment shows you about you, not other people. And resentment is a sign to you either of two things. Listen, um, resentment is a sign of wrong giving. It's okay to say no to others. Remember, you're serving God, not the person. So here's what needs to happen. If you find that you're giving, but you're... Either you should have not done what you're doing, or you should check your attitude. Why are you doing what you're doing? You know, why are you doing what you're doing? The truth is, there's times where you said yes to something, and you just need to say, you know what, I said yes to that, and now I'm going. And just your change of attitude, realizing who you're serving. Your boss might be a doofus. In the Greek, that's doufasai. Right? And, and, and you might have a, a boss that's a jerk. And, and, but if you begin to realize that's not who I'm serving, I'm serving the Lord. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, not because that boss. You know what it will do? You, you'll quit getting angry all the time. You'll quit gossiping all the time. You know, part of the reason we gossip is we think we have to prove we're better than other people because we forget who we're serving. Now, going into the next point, listen to this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself Less. Number two, some of us are trying to silence the, silence the past. Deal with your past in the present. Now, that may sound like mumbo-jumbo, but let me show you how it works. You're driving home. You get on Grissom like I did this morning, and somebody's tailgating you, right? And you're looking in the rearview mirror like, really? Come on. And you start talking to them. They can't hear you, by the way. They can't hear me, but somehow I think, come on now. Come on. Really? Right? 
what passive aggressive thing can I do? I break for I break for tailgaters, bumper sticker, right? You know, whatever. So you get aggravated, or maybe you had a bad day at work and you come home and you're angry or you're frustrated and you don't even realize you're frustrated, but you find yourself like, you know, you're pulling stuff out, slamming stuff on the counter, and, and maybe your spouse says to you, um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a statement I could say in church. I don't know what happened to you today. <laughs> I had one with Cheerios, but I thought that wasn't appropriate. So, <laughs> And you're like, oh, you know, and then you realize, oh, I had a bad day at work. What happened? You took the past into the present. Some of you had things happen to you 20, 30 years ago, and you're still carrying it around. And you're grumpy all the time. Where's Bob? In Isaiah 43, it says this, forget the former things, don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland, or streams in the desert. You know what that's saying? You've got to forget and forgive the past, and you got to move forward. If you find yourself having conversations with people, especially if things that happened weeks or months ago, or wishing that you had had a better comeback to somebody, or having a conversation with somebody who hurt you, if you're having a conversation with them, time to move forward. What happened? You have your mind on the past. You cannot drive and look in the rearview mirror the whole time. You can glance. But you can't stay there. Can't drive and look at your phone. Forget the former things. Don't dwell on it. If you find that you're dwelling on it, you've got to move forward. It's easy to dwell on the past. If a memory is strong enough, it'll keep coming back, and you've got to let it go. <laughs> First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So you need to ask forgiveness from other people if you've messed up something, if you've blown it, if you've accidentally done something, if you've hurt somebody. Now, AA says you ask forgiveness unless to do so would hurt the person. But for some of you, you haven't forgiven yourself. You did something dumb weeks, months, years ago. I'm going to tell you a secret. We all do dumb things. I know. We all say things we didn't mean to say. We all do things that we wish we could undo. We have situations that happen that we wish we had responded better. You've got to not only forgive the other person, you have to forgive yourself. Let me tell you something about people. That person who you're mad at probably doesn't even think about you. And you're still having a conversation with them. You have to forgive and move on and receive God's forgiveness. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. I had somebody come to me, and I'll never forget this, because this, this deals with forgiveness on so many levels. I had somebody come to me and say, hey, I just want you to know, this is somebody I thought was a good friend. They said, I've been mad at you for a year. Now, instantly, I did the flashback thing of thinking of all the conversations I had this for, with this person over the last year, and all the times, hey, brother, how you doing, man? Good. God bless you. <laughs> now, I realized that was all just pretend. They said, I found out you've been stealing money. I said, well, okay, tell me about this money that I'm stealing because I haven't seen it. <laughs> and they said, uh, our church is paying your kids' cell phone bills. I said, what? They said, no, you're not. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen the check written. I'm the one who helps with the budget, and I saw the check written. I said, uh, do you realize that every month I write a check and reimburse the church, and the only reason that... My kid's account is on mine is because I had to use my account for the church. They wouldn't give the church an account at that time. Oh, I didn't know that. Sorry, I've been mad for a year. <laughs> now, let me tell you what happens when you don't deal with forgiveness. Dumb things like that. That person should have come to me as soon as they thought that and said, Eric, I, you know, hey, I'm concerned about this. But let me tell you the other thing about church people in general you guys are awesome, by the way. Let me tell you about some about church people in general. Church people can be really petty. I, I've had people get mad at me about 
the silliest things over the years. I said, go shack in a church service. I had somebody get mad at me for saying go shack because they thought I cussed in church. Sometimes you have to confront a person if it's something serious and they've offended you. But most of the time, can I tell you what you need to do? Just forgive them and get over it. Sometimes it's not their problem, it's yours. If they haven't done something to directly offend you, you shouldn't be talking to other people about it. Get over it. And let me tell you what I tell people in new members class, okay? Those of you who take new members class, you know this. Hey, if you haven't forgiven your last church or your last pastor, please don't join here. Because it'll just be a matter of months and you'll be mad at me. It's true, and I've seen it over and over again. If you're mad at somebody in the past, you'll carry that right into the present. So you've got to learn to bear with each other. Listen to what this next verse uh, says. Bear with each other and forgive one another. This is first century. They're already arguing with each other. Why? Because there's people in church. <laughs> By the way, if you're perfect, go join another church. We don't want to raise the bar here. <laughs> My best line. I love that. All right. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, go beat them up. Talk about them. Gossip them. Oh, wait a second. No. <laughs> forgive as the Lord forgave you. You're not in competition with other people. And guess what? Everybody needs grace. How many of you have ever made a mistake? How many of you ever made a mistake and you didn't even know it till later? How many of you? Was, no, I'm just kidding. Okay. As long as we're raising hands. Anger makes us feel stressed and rushed. Sometimes, you ever got mad at the copy machine? Has that helped you? No, the madder you get, the more you... I'm telling you, it knows when you're stressed. You be nice to that copy machine. Oh, copy machine, I love you, gee, gee, right? Choose forgiveness. Number trace, at eight. We, we please ourselves. Be self-caring, not self-centered. Denying yourself and taking up your cross doesn't mean you say yes to everybody, but it also means it doesn't mean that you don't take care of yourself. In 2 Timothy 3, it says this, mark this, there'll be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive. And then the verse goes on and says, having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. When you get around selfish people, you can't please them. If you become selfish yourself, you are unpleasable. You've got to quit getting your eyes on yourself. But at the same time, that doesn't mean you can't take care of yourself. Listen to what it says in Mark 12. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. That's the first command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor, listen, as yourself. You know what Jesus is doing here? He's assuming you love yourself. He's assuming that you've already got that down. But some of you don't. Some of you are so busy taking care of everyone else, you're not taking care of yourself. If you get on an airplane today, my sister is a flight attendant. <laughs> and she will say, when the mask drop down, Put your mask on first before you put it on your child. You know why? Because that kid is not putting a mask on you. <laughs> and the truth is, some of you are trying to take care of everybody else, and you're not taking care of yourself. Take care of yourself so that you can love God and others. And, and I will say this too. You need to take care of your health. Because you can't love other people if you don't take care of you and you're not around to take care of them. You're spending so much time and, and you're so busy, you're not taking time to exercise or or anything, and you're stressed out and freaked out, and you, you think you're trying to help everybody, but the truth is, the more stressed you become, the less helpful you are. And don't blame the machine that just shot the bullet through the wall. It's their fault. Number last. I could have done the whole sermon on point four. Some of you are trying to please God through works. That's why you're miserable. Remember that salvation is by faith, not works. Some of you can't even have a good quiet time because when you come before God, all you feel is guilt and you didn't do something right or you forget to have your quiet time so you feel like God doesn't love you as much. Listen, the Bible says that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
Let me put that in your lap for a second. That means this. On your worst day, where you do the dumbest thing you've ever done, when you have a hard time forgiving yourself, God still would say, I sent Jesus to forgive your sin. That's how much God loves you. And yet you think you're going to do one little thing and help God love you more. You think, oh, if I light a candle, God will love me more. No. He doesn't love you more because of what you do. I'm glad you came to church today, but God loved you just as much when you were sleeping this morning as sitting here. He's not in heaven going, ooh, they came to church. I guess I can love them now. Let's suppose that I gave Dave a billion dollars. I just like saying a billion because I feel like Carl Sagan. Let's say I gave Dave a billion dollars. And about a week from now, do you think Dave would treat me a little nicer, by the way? Don't you think every time he saw me, he'd be like, hey, it's Brookins. How you doing, buddy? Right? First of all, why? Because he would know what I did for him, and he'd be like, wow. Right? But let's suppose Dave came to me and said, Eric, listen, here's a dollar. I just, I want to thank you for the billion. When you try to do something that you think is going to make God a little happier with you, or is going to help you to get into heaven more, or whatever, it's like somebody gave you a billion dollars, and you're like, here's a dollar. That's not in the Bible. We make that up. Why do we make it up as humans? Well, sometimes because we're trying to get money. Sometimes because we like works. It makes us feel better about ourselves. But the truth is, when you receive God's grace, you recognize that he loves you. That doesn't mean that you don't need to ask forgiveness. It doesn't mean that you don't have to say to God, God, I want to do what you want me to do. But it's backwards. Instead of trying to earn his love, he's already given you his love. You do what you do because you recognize his love. Before I read this next verse, I want to practice something real quick. Close your eyes right where you're at for just a second. If you're not a Christian, you can do this too. It's okay. Now, if you're not a Christian, you don't believe in God, then you can do this for the God you don't believe in. But if you're a Christian, I just want you right now to imagine yourself coming before God. And instead of trying to earn his love, instead of trying to please him, just take a moment and thank him for how much he loves you. Take a moment and thank him for the forgiveness He's given you, not because you deserved it, but because that's what he does. And take a moment just to rest in his peace. In Hebrews 11, 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Go ahead and open your eyes. In Ephesians 2, 8, it says this, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. If I gave Dawson a gift this morning, and then he came to me later and said, Hey, dude, I want to pay you for that gift. It's not a gift. It's the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. Isn't that good news? You can't boast. And, and here's what's awesome. No matter who you are, you may think, Oh, well, the pastor's more spiritual than me. Let me tell you what's awesome about this verse. It's the fact that because God gives us his righteousness... You are as righteous as me, and I am as righteous as somebody. I'm as righteous as Jesus Christ. The Bible says that. And then it goes on. No one can boast. Why? For we're God's handiwork. You know, if you're struggling with self-esteem, this word literally means you were handmade by God. And then it continues. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works for God prepared for us in advance to do. Here's the deal. We get it backwards. We do good works thinking that that's going to make God love us more. It's the other way around. After you receive God's love and you realize how much he loves you, then you begin to go, huh, God, I'm, I'm, I want to do it. What do you want me to do? Because we're so grateful and we're so thankful. See, if you look at the Christian life like a checklist, you're going to go through and go, I guess I have to do this. I guess I have to do this. I guess I have to do this. Now I'll do this. But if you realize what God's done for you and realize you have freedom, and now you have freedom to worship him, and now you have freedom to do what he's called you to do, you have freedom to say no to people. Then you begin to live in that yoke that Jesus talked about, the nesty plunge. You learn to live in that refreshment, realizing that, yeah, I'm messed up, I'm broken, I fail. I blow it, but I receive God's forgiveness. 
I don't have to please everyone. Now let me tell you this. You cannot earn or improve on salvation. You're not a little more saved because you did something today. I mean, I'd love you to say, hey, Eric, every day, but it's really not a good thing, okay? You know, just because you give money today doesn't make you more saved. I would love that. It doesn't work that way. Just because you came to church today doesn't make you, God loves you more today than he did yesterday. He absolutely loves you. But here's what's awesome. When you realize that, you can receive it by faith. You can live a life of faith understanding that it's by grace you're saved. You don't have to please everyone. You don't have to try to keep silencing your past. You don't have to just try to please yourself. You don't even have to earn your way to God. It's time to take on his yoke of faith and grace so that you can have peace, so that you can have rest. If you'll learn that, and when you go through life, instead of being frustrated and irritated, you'll walk through life with his peace. Some of you, even with me talking about grace, you're there in the back of your mind going, but what about? Because it's so hard to receive grace when we've been taught law all our lives. God wants to give you his grace through faith. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, Jesus died for your sins. We all know that we're messed up and broken. And the Bible says he died for our sins and rose again so that when we say, Jesus, I want to give you my life, and we surrender to him, that's what it means to be a Christian. It's not just knowing about Jesus. It's not just going to church. It's not understanding. But it's when we say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I'm a sinner. I'm messed up. I surrender to you, and I receive your free gift of salvation. If you're here today and you want to do that, I'll be here after the service and you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ. Maybe you're here today and you struggle with some of these points. I encourage you, wrestle with these things. Let God continue to work on you what it means to really walk in grace. I'm not trying to please everybody, but just rest in his yoke, knowing that he loves you and cares about you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for your grace through faith. Lord, I thank you that when we ask forgiveness, you forgive. And Father, you say our sins are as far as the east is from the west. You forget them. And yet, Father, we remind you of them. So I pray today we could rest in your forgiveness. For that one today that's struggling with forgiving themselves, I pray that they would. Father, for that one who's not being obedient to you because they don't understand what you've done for them, I pray today they would receive your rest. And Father, it would cause them to want to obey and to walk with you. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have our time of offering. You give what God's put on your heart today, not grudgingly, not because he makes you, but because you're thankful for what he's done for you. Thanks for being here this morning. Mm -hmm.